Okay, a uh, very high level recap. I believe everyone is uh, kind of familiar with this based on the previous class, but we are just going to go over it at a very high level before we get in depth into it, okay? And then also um, you will realize that this slide has a lot of um, different steps. So for each lecture, yeah, we will discuss that Bridget uh, by the end of um, the class. Please uh, remember to bring it up. All right, back to what I was saying. You will see that this slide is kind of, um, sorry, this deck has multiple um, steps from step zero through six. Just keep in mind for each class, each of the activity class that we are doing, we are going to be just limited to one or two slides that are related to that activity. So for like today, we will touch upon step zero and step one, but you do still have access to the remaining steps in the slide. Okay, high level recap. We are familiar with FISMA. We are familiar with how NIST is responsible for driving the um, FISMA requirements for civilian side or other non-sensitive organizations, a uh, non-sensitive um, side of the US federal government space. We are also uh, familiar with the DOD side of things and DISA in terms of what is DISA and also we discuss FEDRAM, how FEDRAM is kind of limited to cloud service providers. If anyone is not clear on this, please let me know right now would be a good time to just, especially around the NIST, what is NIST and what is the role of NIST? I believe we covered that in the previous lecture, but happy to spend a minute or two in this. Okay, part of the process of achieving um, FISMA compliance and implementing those NIST guidelines and uh, processes that were documented is to follow these six steps. This is in line with the RMF steps. You will keep hearing about it. That is the risk management framework. Keep in mind that there are other frameworks like the CSF, that's the cloud sec um, security framework and um, other frameworks that NIST um, works on. But we are now, for this class, we are just going to look into the RMF step. Uh, sorry, the RMF process. With respect to the RMF process, there is a document called NIST 800-37. I believe I put a link to it. I highly recommend everyone to kind of read it um, at a very high level to just understand the different steps as well as how they kind of um, are interconnected, starting with the prepare step as the first step and then categorize, select, all of them going through it, right? This is zero, by the way. This is one, two, three, four, five, and six. The prepare step is zero, not one. The document NIST 800-37 does not tell you how to categorize. It does not tell you how to select the controls, implement, or any of these steps. It only set the tone as kind of like the ground information of how everything should be done from end to end, as well as what are the different steps. But for each single step, well, it did talk in depth about the prepared uh, step, that is step zero, which we're also going to touch about today. But when you come to categorize your system, there is um, different uh, documentation starting with like FIPS 199, including the special publication 860. And also um, the special publication is in like Rev 1 and 2, which we are also going to talk about today. When we get to um, the step two selecting controls, we will touch upon, um, especially around FIPS 200 and uh, FIPS 800-53. Any question on this? Okay, great. Um, so how do we prepare and what does preparation means? Just like the definition. This is where we are looking into basically coming up with all of these information. So taking a little step back, before the prepare step, 
um that was i believe before uh prepare came out december that's when nest added it to the 800-37 that is um december 2019 but before then the first step is categorization everybody's expected to categorize but it used to create a lot of confusions around these agencies, as well as all of these um, different organizations that are implementing because they are just getting straight into it without really planning for how to even do it. What are the right tools to use? Who are the responsible parties and all of those things. So you find a scenario where an agency is maybe implementing a certain system they go from step sorry one two three so they have implemented everything and now it's time for assessment like the three pao or even the internal assessors and because during the planning phase there wasn't even any planning phase they did not really identify who should be the assessor or who should be the auditor or who should be the three pao or things like that as such it usually results into this downtime because everybody's now scrambling to like okay let's go and look for an assessor or let's try to identify this so to really mitigate all of these kind of NIST recommends going through a lot of planning steps now it's not limited to this but what's the goal of the planning step to basically identify what is the system that we are trying to build what is the description of the system acronym unique identifiers if we are leveraging any service provider like say cloud service provider Let's make the decision, not wait till we get to the step. Um, what are we looking for when it comes to the service providers? Have we looked into the system architecture? What are the security boundaries, the networking? Do we need have requirements around, say, TIC, that is trusted internet connections? Have we identified a TIC provider? All of these things. Now, we might not necessarily be able to answer all of these questions before we start, but we will be able to track what do we need as we move forward. Right. So basically all I'm saying is, oh, you can start building the system without really answering the question of, hey, do, did we identify a tick provider? But the fact that we are tracking that, yes, we do need a tick provider kind of uh, allow us to prepare before we get to that step where we need to implement tick. So all of these kind of things, there is really no checklist of what is preparation, but there is definitely a need to plan as well as prepare for all of those things. We also need to identify based on what we're trying to achieve or what the system is trying to achieve or our organization or what we the type of data we are collecting, what type of documentation, deliverable artifacts, ATO packet do we need to build, right? What types of, um, what needs to go into that ATO package? Whenever you hear ATO package, just think of it as deliverables deliverables in the sense of you will hear the word interchangeable between artifacts and deliverables but just think of it as different documentations or requirements or certain um i will guess i will say artifacts again that needs to all come together to be built as a package and then submit it to achieve an ato so an ato package depending on the organization depending on the agency depending on the data type might include all of this, might include part of this, might include all the things that are not even here. That's why I added et cetera, right? Today, we are going to touch upon 199 and other ones. That is part of the um, categorization, right? The security system security categorization. Why do we need to categorize? We'll also touch upon that. SSP, you will hear a lot of this being set across like SSP, SSP. While SSP is very important, it really is. It's an overarching um, document that kind of collects all the information in one place. SSP is not really the main thing because a lot of documents, like within an SSP, there is the fifth one ninety nine categorization. There are the selected controls. They are um, definitely not a server program, but you will find a piece of the e-authentication. You can find a little bit of the BIA, the risk assessment, maybe, maybe not, right? So all of those things, again, we are talking about privacy documentations. If you, if you have any uh, privacy related stuff, then you might have to then implement 
privacy controls instead of um, in addition to just um, the security controls, right? So they will also go into the SSP. You will also find like the architectural and boundary diagrams included like networking, like IP, port numbers, service providers, right, is all documented in the SSP. So the SSP can be an overarching document that encompass all of these, right? But in addition to that, there are certain places that you would go that they actually do not necessarily have an SSP in itself. They have individual documentations and that is how it's being tracked. An example is, even though we are not using that, you go to a place like say, parts of DOD, they don't have a single document as the SSP, but rather when it comes to like the security control, they have this SCTM, security control traceability matrix, mostly in um, either track in like emails or maybe as a spreadsheet. And then you have other documentations, right? Related to that. And then you will find maybe the SSP is really a lightweight document where it's maybe pointing to the different documentations. Whereas you go to a place like say Fedron, based on their templates, you are expected to document all of the security controls within the email, uh, within the SSP. And then also a part of these documentations, even though you're doing them individually, they all still need to be bundled within the SSP. So you find you can see an SSP, especially like if it's a high, um, Hi, um, let's say it's Fedram high, don't be surprised after you put all your security control information for it to reach like 800 or maybe at least 400, depending on how much implementations you're doing, right? Um, sorry, let me quickly see something for it. Okay, I don't think it relates to me. Um, Harry was just adding information on the chat uh, box, right? So these identifying if this applies, it's also something we need to do at the prepare step. Let me give you an example of what will happen if you don't do this. You don't identify what type of deliverables, what type of ATO package you need to build. Let's say you have, you're collecting um, health records, PHI, right? And you didn't identify what type of privacy documentations you are supposed to build, right? you might not even track it like, yeah, I, need, I don't need to do that. Or even actually worse, scratch all of that. Let me give another example. Let's say you're collecting PHI, right? You also identify, hmm, we need to build these privacy documents. But what you forget is, oh, in addition to these controls, there are also privacy controls that you need to implement that are related to PHI, right? What will happen is, you just keep going on, you implement all of these security controls on your system, you start documenting uh, your privacy documentations, even though the private, like the privacy controls requires you to do that, that's part of them, like especially around those DE controls, they kind of require you to do that. But still you do need to check mark that you have done the privacy controls, right? So you finish, you finish putting your security controls, um, documentation maybe within the SSP, you, that's where you documented it, or maybe you're using some form of spreadsheet, but you are not tracking the privacy controls. And then an assessor comes into the picture, you submit everything here, but then they open your spreadsheet and they see like, hmm, why does your security control, why is it that your um, control, control list does not include the privacy specific controls and you're submitting these privacy documents. Every assessor will want you to include that because you are collecting either PII or PHI. Those are all kind of issues that you, people will tend to find themselves if they do not plan accordingly, right? There are also around system of records. There are also around retention requirements. Maybe you need to satisfy some retention requirements around documentations or maybe uh, records of um, people who have accessed the system or whatsoever, but you completely forgot about it. Another thing, Maybe um, we mentioned TIC earlier, right? Trusted internet connection, but that you are using maybe to access the internet, this is your system, you're using it to access the internet, but maybe you are also using another system here to actually authenticate, right? Authenticate user because your system X 
doesn't have authentication capabilities. So maybe you're leveraging a third party authenticator, maybe like say Okta or another service provider, or even integrating AD, a system that has already been authorized before. What happens is because this system is talking with this system or this system is going through this channel that is maybe managed by say Verizon or CenturyLink, which they all have received their authorizations before, also here authorization, but your system is still communicating with them, you need to make sure that you have an agreement with them, right? Something like this, the interconnection security agreement. Some call it system, some call it security, but that's what we call the ISA, right? So what happens is if you don't identify this at the early phase, and now you have reached pretty much, you have finished building your system, you have done your testing whatsoever, within your system without having to do the authentication. And now you want to quickly integrate and see like, huh, let's connect with this system or maybe go through this path to make sure that everything works well. Or maybe you are even trying to connect with it and just kind of um, make sure that everything is working accordingly, right? You do that and now you build all of this package without really documenting the ISA. An assessor, when they come into the picture, they will ask you what are the security agreements that identify who, how behavior here is being managed? What risk are you inheriting by connecting in here or connecting to this system? These are all part of it. Another thing that could happen around here is you actually forgot because you need to document an ISA. So you don't know within the ISA that there are certain requirements that you need to do, but yes, of course, your developers contacted the developers here and you got an API or whatsoever, you are able to connect between this point A to point B. But still, there are certain, from a security and compliance perspective, there are certain things that you need to do, right? But you never did it. When assessors comes into the picture, as they're assessing the entire system, they will want to see this. Guess what happens if there is none? Maybe they fail you. Maybe you capture it as a finding. Right, so all of these bottlenecks is truly, truly why step zero is very, very important. All right, any question on this? We have some time, so. Food, Dr. Food. Ibrahim, please, question. So uh, speaking of this ISA that they could fail you, is this just an example because my other things will fail you too, right? It doesn't have to be only this one. Yeah, I was just giving an example of how if you fail to prepare, before you even start doing the RMF steps or whatsoever, if you fail to prepare and maybe you're integrating between point A to point B, you might forget to really know that you have some ISA agreement that you need to put in place. As such, it could affect you. Gotcha, so it's not, it doesn't have a significant uh, role compared to the others, okay. I mean, when you say it doesn't have significant role compared to the others, what like you priorities, you know, or most ask or what they care most about. So for every RMF, it's going to be unique to what the system is it that you are building. There is no one template for everybody, right? So you will find maybe you don't need to document any song system of record notice because it doesn't apply to you. Maybe you don't even need an ISA completely because you are not connecting with anybody, right? A very example, good example of a system that might never need an ISA could be just a public website that is meant for information that is sitting on some sort of cloud provider, like say Azure, and there's like static web here, and you just put all your HTML or CSS or whatever it is, and there's really no connection between this website and anything. It's just exposed to the internet because it's providing information. You really don't need an ISA. Does that make sense? Uh, it makes great sense. So Dr. Ibrahim, who does formulate the package and make sure it's fully applicable to the environment? A lot of people, right? So again, let's take a step back. Let's say you are standing this website, I gave an example. For every organization, and you keep hearing me talking about it in the previous classes, there has to be ownership. So who owns this? By owning, not necessarily from real definition of ownership, but who is accountable for it, right? That is where we have, and this is a system. It's considered a system, so we'll always have a system owner, right? 
But then also there has to be someone accountable, right? For the security of this information. Keep in mind, the system owner might be more focused on the usability and functionality of the system, not necessarily the security, but from a security angle, there has to be that person whose primary responsibility or primary accountability, well, primary responsibility is to ensure the security state of this system is maintained. That person will be the ISSO, right? And then again, you will hear a lot of words, like some place will have ISSM, maybe because the ISSM, there are many systems and they are the one person looking over it as the manager for all of those systems, or they, it could be only one system, depending on the organization. Some places from a technical perspective, like if we, the security side is being maintained from a techno, technical perspective, you will find like an ISSE, Information System Security Engineer, just like from also technical perspective, you have the developers or system admin, just focusing entirely on functionality and operation, right? Now, again, there has to be that one person who, well, by person, I, it could be a body, right? An organization, but there has to be an entity who would say like, okay, this system, functionality, operation, security, its expectations and everything has been met and it's in accordance with the organization. And it basically meets expectation. As such, we can use this system within our institution, organization, agency, whatsoever. That person making that call, what they are doing is they are authorizing the use of that system, right? That authorizing it. They are authorizing the use of that system is what we call authority to operate, right? That is whenever you have ATO, the person or individual or body or whoever it is that allows the system to be used by granting an ATO is what, who we call authorizing official. Does that clarify? Yes, Dr. Ibrahim, thank you. Sure thing. Any additional question? Just keep them coming. Yeah, and Hank here. Uh, so, so I would say the the authorization official is usually the person that signs off on the letter that allows uh, the system owner to mm -hmm. uh, use the system. Correct. Yes. And and he kind of supports the uh, uh, the the CISO in in his authorization. So, uh, for example, in, in our organization, the CISO is ultimately. Uh, responsible, but but the authorizing official really is kind of like the uh, uh, the den daddy of the validators that that ensure that the systems are accredited. So no, just some kind of clarity, like yes and no. Do not take authorizing of retail as a rank, like it's not a dedicated position, right? The CISO could be the AO. Does that make sense? Say again, sir. The CISO, that is the CISO, Chief Information Security Officer, could be the AO. The CISO could be the one that is saying, okay, this system right, right, right. meets the expectation. So in that situation, they are the other AO. Right, right. It's it's how you want to in 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 uh, inject your checks and balances, right? So uh, absolutely. Yeah. It is also on the hierarchy of the system itself, right? If you look at maybe, um, I would say if the system is applicable organization-wide, or maybe it's considered an organizational level system, then you will find that the CISO or whoever the AO is going to be might be the CISO that is organization-wide, right? But if the system is going to be used, maybe let's say, let's say it's an organization with multiple branches in different states, right? This is state A, state B, and Virginia, right? So if the system that we are implementing is going to be used, maybe organization-wide, this is just an example, by the way, maybe all of these states will use it, then it could be that the CISO that is at this level, the overall CISO must have to be the AO, right? That CISO could be the AO. But if the system is only just meant for Virginia related, because it's only informing the people that are working within that organization, but just in Virginia, then chances are this authorizing official here that, that is going to authorize this system might be the CISO of only Virginia. 
Does that make sense? Yes. But guess what? That's a very good question because identifying who the AO should be is also part of, right? All of these things. It's all part of planning, prepare whatsoever. Ideally planning should take some time into like looking all the nitty gritty parts of things to see what do we need to do? Just keep in mind, you don't need to answer all the questions to start um, implementing or start even the RMF steps, but to identify the questions themselves, it's a big deal because now you will be able to track, hey, we have not identified who our, I can see that even here, I didn't add, add it, but we have not identified who our um, assessor should be. Okay, maybe we need some, um, some approval from someone, all of those things. Okay, so maybe we are now tracking like, okay, we don't have an assessor. That's fine. We are tracking it in whatever document we're using to track open items and then we'll begin our RMF step, but then someone is responsible for making sure that we identify an assessor before we reach step four of the RMF, right? So all of those things will be, we will be able to do it at the prepare. We might not get all the answers, but we will definitely be able to track it. Um, resources, technology, documentations. I've given multiple uh, technical examples in the class, but uh, one that I keep going back to is around the usage of that uh, compatibility between say iPhone, iMessage, and maybe an organization in another Asian country or um, somewhere in the world, like using an Android device, right? But then the main source of um, the communication method is text messages or, well, chat maybe, messaging system, right? Where iPhone, iMessage is not compatible with maybe Android way of message as such is going to impact, right? So how do you know that? So you will be able to identify it during step zero. Maybe there are, um, certain technical implementation guidelines for a specific tool you're using, you will be able to identify it. You'll be able to know like, hey, the system we're trying to stand up right now, it's not going to be compatible with our organization or it doesn't have this function that we need. Or actually, you know what? Because we are going to, this is just an example. No, because we are going to use, well, I saw the iPhone stuff today. So let's use an iPhone. Because we are going to, use um, implement iPhone 12 organization wide, like we're going to authorize it to be used. We also need a device that is going to support maybe 5G, okay? Do we need to go and buy another 5G device? Uh, not really because iPhone will activate it maybe in iPhone 12 will come with 5G in six months. So is it worth it for us to just finish everything and wait six months before we need it? Yeah, maybe it is because our device that we are building internally a little IoT device that requires 5G will also not be ready till eight months. So if we have commitments from Apple that 5G will be ready in six months, then we don't need to spend another money to buy the device, right? These are all things that you will think of during the preparation step. Does this make sense? The way I'm drawing on this, I'm, I think I'm Picasso, anyway. <laughs> Any question on this part before I get into how I authorized my own, sorry, what I did with my system for planning. Obviously, any organization will be different. Oh, actually, before I get into that, templates. A lot of organizations have their own specific templates, right? Um, some are using Fedram templates, but even though it's mostly for cloud service providers, but a lot of agencies have their own custom templates. Some do not really use templates in the like word processing format, like Excel, Word, or whatsoever, rather they use tools, right? GRC tools, we spoke about this, governance, risk, and compliance tools, like EMAS, RSA Archer, right? Exacta, these are all tools, right? Um, so yeah, for the class activity, we mentioned it, like everybody knows where to get it. I keep asking, is there any question on this? No? Good. Either I'm doing a very good job or I'm doing a terrible job that I'm boring people. By the way, please, 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 please be sure to take the mid-semester evaluation. I believe it's open. Okay, I'm going to switch screen. 
and quickly talk about how I presented my, how I'm presenting my own system, right? Give me a second. So, actually, let me just share the entire screen. Hmm. Perfect, can everybody see it? So, if you refer to the other one we mentioned, identifying documentations and all of those things, right? But again, the system that we are going to stand up must have a name. What is the name of the system? So we are going to stand up, just think of Canvas, how Canvas is for this entire um, hands-on activity that we are going to do on my part, not yours. Mine is going to be just a stand up a learning management system similar to Canvas for um, Marymount University, right? So what is the system name? It's going to be Marymount, uh oh, give me a second. It's going to be Marymount Learning Management System, right? Does the system have an acronym? ML, ML, MS, all right. What is the system? Obviously, you will have more content than this. This is just high level for the sake of a class. If we say we are going to do a full blown 100% end to end ATO where I'm standing a production like environment and doing a ready like ATO package, yeah, I don't think we are going to finish it in the little time we have. So, high level description what is MLMS? It's just a student instructor collaboration platform and student records management system. Just think of Canvas, if this is hard to wrap your head around, right? That's what it is. Now, which organization who owns the system? Organization wise, right? Where, which organization is this system going to be applicable to? What is the system? MLM, MLMS. What is the organization that owns it? Marymount University. Who is the service provider from a preparer perspective, right? What do I mean by that? Like who owns the underlying systems that are going to be used? Marymount IT department owns that, right? So meaning Marymount IT department will also oversee this. They own the infrastructure that we are going to stand up this entirely, right? Meaning there is some sort of servers, a data center, right? And then um, some hardware, whatsoever, OS, all running before we put the software, or at least the code, right, for Canvas. Well, I will switch to MLMS. Give me a second. Right? MLMS. OK. Who is the system owner? I am. But I'm adding the tag SO just so we understand. And this, for this session, I'm wearing many hats, right? Obviously, ideally, in a real um, scenario, it's not going to be the same person. Absolutely not. But for this, I don't want to come up with names, so I'm using myself, right? I'm the system owner. Just keep in mind, I added SO. I'm also the information system security officer. I added it here. And I'm also the authorizing official. These are three individuals, just three personas, OK? Any question on this, the high level? All good? Awesome. So let's look at, from an architectural viewpoint, I mentioned this, right? What should it look like? Again, this is not a perfection. If you are coming from this networking background, physical security background, technology background, please don't take me in pieces. This is just something easy to understand. Do not tear me apart. <laughs> okay. Now, let's look into this. This is the security boundary architecture for the entire system, but I'm also making it serve as multiple things, right? I'm also looking at it from a networking. Again, this is not a clear networking diagram, absolutely not, but I will touch upon it, that at a very high level, right? So starting from completely outside, I will touch a little bit on networking. Think of your internet at home. You have Comcast, Verizon, whatsoever. For my non-techie people, please pay attention for my networking tech savvy. Then please don't come after me and say like, 
that's wrong. No, yes, I know that what I'm saying, it's wrong. I am saying it at the very common level, not so sophisticated. So just bear with me here, okay? Think of Verizon, AT&T, whatsoever that you're subscribing to, right? They will give you an IP address. That IP address that they are issuing to you from outside is going to be your external IP. This is what Verizon or whoever your internet service provider allocates to you, right? In your case, if you check your external IP today, you will see something and tomorrow or maybe a week later you check, you will see it different. It will continuously change because they are assigning dynamic IPs to you. But most businesses, they will have a static IP assigned to them, meaning that is their IP or they even own it, right? So in this scenario, we are going to assume I, we own this, right? As our external IP address. But for every single environment from the internal side, even you, the internet you have at home, even though Verizon is giving you an external IP, internally, that cable that came in either to your model, modem or if you have only a router where your router is serving as a modem and a router or whatsoever, the first device or the second device is definitely doing some form of translation between your external IP and internal IP. Your internal IP, if you have never changed your router or maybe never updated your IP addresses on your router or server, or you're one of those people that you just go with whatever the default password is on your device, chances are you are on that 192.168 network, right? Because that's just very common for all devices these days. They come with this pre-default um, kind of IP address, right? Maybe one nine two dot one six eight dot one dot one is the main IP, like the gateway or something like that. Okay, your main device. Let's say your router here. If you are using Verizon Fiber, maybe they brought in LAN. Like your sorry, they brought in Ethernet straight. So maybe you don't have a modem. You are just actually. You know what? Let me do a better drawing. Yeah. Let's say this is also your home. This is you in your little couch with your laptop sitting down. And this is you, I guess, in the laptop. Let's take it like that. And you are connected to your little router wirelessly, right? This is you. But then this is your router. Technically, in, from to you, it's sitting inside your house. But to me, it's literally just connecting your external to internal. So I'm going to put it on the boundary. And this is Verizon. They give, give you this internet, you paid them 70 bucks, they give you one gigabit per second connection and you are feeling good streaming your Fortnite. All right, this is your route, right? Assuming they give you ethernet to connect to the router. If this is not how yours work or how it looks, and you're like, this guy is saying crap because I don't have a router. I have this little white device that Comcast gave me before they allowed me to connect to my router. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. You are just having a coaxial and you need a modem to switch it to whatever before connecting to your router. So, potato, potato. Um, this part is what is your, pro pro your provider is giving you and here. So basically your router will be, I don't want to use the networking terms. Let's say it will be exchanging whatever the IP address your provider, like your Verizon, Comcast, whatsoever is giving you and switching it to the internal IP, right? Basically assigning it. The reason for that is because, especially with this IP version four, yeah, we are collecting so many devices that we have already exhausted. And well, we do have IP version six, they can allocate it now to literally every single device, but still, even for security reasons, I don't want that. Everybody should have their own internal network. I assure you, if you have never changed your router, you look it up internally, chances are you're on that 192.168. But in an ideal situation, I recommend you get on either that 10.10 .10 or, oh, the 192 is also good, 168, they're all internal IP addresses under 172, right? They're all internet IP addresses. Okay. Professor, Beyond those it. are called non-routable IP addresses. Yep. 
non routable IP addresses. I do not want to get into that because people will start, what do you mean by a routable? And this is not a networking class. So let's tread carefully there. Keep in mind we are staying to risk management, but yes, the non routable IP addresses, absolutely correct. Um, so based on that, we will have an internal IP, we will have an external IP. FYI, technically one could guess if you are one of those who never change your IP, but please don't expose this publicly. Technically you can't expose it, but you can make people know what your internal IPs are, right? So switching to our system now, is it safe to say Marimond is not a service provider. It's not an internet service provider. So I don't know who Marimond uses, but definitely they pay somebody, right? To get internet connections. That person will give them a dedicated IP. I say a dedicated IP or a static IP because a place like Marimond, they will definitely pay for a static IP unlike us that will rely on that dynamic IP that continuously change. Why? Because Marimond will have a lot of resources internally that you need to access. The more this change, the harder it is to really maintain those internal resources and they become non-routable, right? Because Marimont either continuously need to update or they start paying another provider to maintain that um, DNS. Well, ignore the DNS. Just don't ask me what that is. Not in a networking class. All right. Second thing, it's this is the one coming from Marimont. This is a device. Uh, I guess this doesn't look like a router, but whatever it is, this is a device that is translating from the external to Marimount's internal IP address. Whenever you connect your laptop to Marimount Wi-Fi, you are getting assigned one of its internal IP. Okay, this already exists. Good. Second, within Marimount, we have different buildings. Let's assume you go to the Boston Center you enter that new fancy building with Starbucks sitting in here, right? You enter the, that new fancy building, already there is HVAC in there. There are also networking services. That's why you're able to connect to the Wi-Fi. There is electricity already, and there is physical security, not necessarily in like a form of tungsten, but there are actually individuals that are sitting there as well, right? Looking into who is a student and who looks fishy, right? There are a bunch of hardware appliances, depending on what you want to call hardware, but I know there are laptops, there are servers, there are printers, there are all of those things available, right? Good. Now, I do not know if there is one in Marymount, but let's just say there is a data center within that. Please, if at any point in time I'm losing you, just let me know, okay? Now we are all clear. This is maybe that entrance floor, ground floor or whatsoever it is. And now you kind of go through all those stairs because you are like me, you don't really get on those elevators, you know, trying to get in your steps because you're competing with your family members on Apple steps. So you're going to 5833 to floor 5833. That is the cyber department area on whatsoever. And next to Dave's office, there is a little data center, which is in room 5833. Cool. When you go into the, that data center, also it might have its own dedicated HVAC or to control the temperature within the data center, but I didn't put it. Let's ignore that for now. Within the data center, you go in there, what do you see? Racks, racks of devices, a lot of them, like different styles whatsoever. Those fancy looking tall computer with many cables and you know indicators, green, blue, yellow, you name it, right? Let's just focus on one. Go in there, you see a server, a huge hardware server. Maybe it's a Dell R65. This is just a model number. I think I just came up with this or there's one I can't remember. I don't know if I Googled to see it, but yeah. There's a hardware server there. There are so many ports going in and out and whatsoever, some from a switch, whatsoever. Ignore all the networking side of it. Just focus on the server. Also, it has maybe this two cables that are all dedicated to power because this is a really powerful machine that needs two power sources, right? So still ignore that. Let's focus on what that device is. It's a hardware blade. Oh no, it scratched the word blade. It's a hardware server, basically, right? And it also have an IP address. See how it is like 10, 10, 10, maybe 10, 10, 10 as well here. And I put like this on a subnet of this. 
I assure you, Mario Mount by definitely definitely doesn't use this uh, subnet because just the people having this class or multiple classes are definitely going to exhaust it. But just for the sake of example, let's say this IP addresses. So it could be when you connect your laptop, you get 10 to 10 to 10 to 29. You get maybe the 18 random IPs, right? Within that all the way to 255. So this hardware server has 10 to 10 to 10 to 45. It already exists because it is holding other things. I'm trying to think of something. Uh, maybe Mariman own website, personal website. Well, there's nothing like personal. Marimon's website where the entire cyber security or your PhD applications whatsoever, how they are collecting it online is all hosted within this server. Good, we get that. Now, because it's a server, a little bit high level, if you don't know this, I will recommend, especially in this day and age of cloud computing, go and understand the different abstraction of like infrastructure platform and, um, software as a service, right? I think, I believe there are classes. So this hardware appliance is there. You also put, ideally you have, think of this as the Dell, right? And then you have what we call a hypervisor, right? If you're taking on a type A virtualization, right? This is a hypervisor. That is where you have words like maybe VMware, ESXi, or you hear of like centric, uh, Z Wait, is it centric or what do they call it? I can't remember, but Zen hypervisor, right? Um, Citric, all right, Citrix Zen hypervisor, it's another. And then like even the KVMs, right? Those are all hypervisors. So it's running here. What it allows you to do is you put many types of virtual machines, right? Like operating systems, like maybe you have Linux servers here, a Linux server here, maybe Red Hat, Linux 7. Maybe you also have Windows Server here. You might also have another Windows Server here because I need to sell Microsoft products to you guys. Anyway, so within it, you will also go ahead and put some form of a platform application related stuff, right? Maybe a web server, just because you have this fancy website that you're trying to put. And then that it could be Apache Web Server, right? You connect it to a database, which is also running separately. And well, switching back to Marimount, there is a web server, and then they will put all their Marimount website where you are applying for your PhD here, right? That is one. But then that is within this, uh, hold on. That is only within this virtual machine. But the other virtual machine, this might actually just be stood up right now because you're going to put another uh, maybe web application and then put another, I mean, you know what? You can even put a container in there instead of a web application or something like that, right? You can put maybe just create some form of network address storage, sorry, um, a NAS storage or whatsoever, right? Just another system, which is not a website like this. Please, if you don't understand this, I highly recommend you take the basics of cloud computing and not necessarily virtualization because I took it on that virtualization route. But if you don't understand this concept, try to definitely understand the differences between infrastructure as a service, platform as a service and software as a service. You understand at a high level, the abstractions I'm talking about, even though they are not necessarily a cloud computing, I'm talking about more of a virtualization perspective, but still understanding this will provide clarity as well as, especially in the RMF world today, there is a lot of modernization going on around switching to that. So based on my example now, I 100% skipped that virtualization because I'm not looking to confuse people with like that uh, VMware ESXi or whatsoever ESXi, ignore that. Completely I skipped it, right? But let's assume it's the, what is running within this server. Based on that, we will stand up a completely separate virtual machine. That virtual machine will be running a Linux, uh, Linux instance of CentOS 7 server, right? Or even Red Hat server. You can even use Windows 
server, for example, right? Or guess what? You can use your ordinary Windows operating system. For, the, for this class, I don't care what you use, truthfully. But on top of it, you will also install a platform like maybe an Apache Tom's, uh, Tomcat web server that allows you to build a website on top or to build some form of application on top of it, right? So you will install this and we will then install our MLMS application. We have amazing software developers, they all build it, write all of those codes whatsoever and it's going to be here. Does that make sense? Now, from external viewpoint, that is, if you are accessing that application, not from here, but rather like you're going through, okay, you know what, let me, just a second. This is you, not inside Marymount completely, behind your computer at home, you have your amazing, amazing Verizon connection that they are giving it to you. You, from here, your laptop your, is going through your router, it goes into the internet, blah, blah, blah. But to you over here, all you put is mlms.com and it took you to Marymount's uh, thing, whatever, similar to Canvas, right? So let's assume this is Canvas. But again, you put it, it takes you there. Truthfully, what happens is in a very simplistic manner, network people, shh, not talking to you guys. I'm talking to the general people, all right. In simplistic time, what happens is this is you, whether you're connected through Wi-Fi or cable, it passes through your router at home. If you have another modem, it goes through it. It goes into the internet, Verizon, take it, take it all around the world, take it all the way to Mars, space, just kidding, no Mars and space. But seriously, it will bounce across, right? Maybe if you're in Virginia accessing it to another service in Virginia, maybe if you check the route, it will be easier, like it will be straightforward because it's all within lo your locality. But don't be surprised, truthfully. If your internet at home here is Verizon and whoever is serving Marymount is Xfinity, then maybe Verizon at some point they need to pass it on to Xfinity. This all happens without you knowing, right? It bounces all across. If you wanna know in depth about this, go take a networking class or you can run IP or I, uh, I, I have route on your computer. All right, so internet. Right, it passes on whatsoever. Eventually, it comes to here, Marymount's IP. They take that information that you put in just mlms.com. They take it here, translate it to this. Okay, it has to be on the ten the ten address. But which system is holding it? Oh, it's this server. So yeah, we're going to go to ten the ten the ten dot forty five system. We go in there. There are so many things running in here. How do we know what we are trying to access? Oh, it's on port 443. By the way, port 443 is an external thing. I shouldn't have used this, but internally, something else, right? So it all happens, blah, 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 and then you access it. So around 10.10.10.45 .10 .10 on port 443, what you are serving is mlms.com but maybe on 10.10.10.45, .10 .10 this 45 on a 3219 port number is some application separate that is also running on this server, but maybe it's just Marymount games. Maybe Marymount decided to host Fortnite. Okay, so for the sake of this class, in my prepare stage, high level, this is our system. And in this class, every single thing you are seeing outside of this little green dot, right, is already in place. The only thing that we are building in this class is only what is in this green dot. Hence why we call it the authorization boundary. It means this, this, this level, all of these services have already been authorized way, way, way back before we are decide to implement what is in here. This is what we are going to inherit. If it's confusing, don't worry. As we go through it, you will understand. Just keep your eye on this green dot. I'm not saying it's only the green dot, but that is what we are building. But every other thing is important. You are going to need this. 
guess what? I'm not give you any. I'm not gonna give you any grade for this. Nope. You're planning for how to be successful in the RMF in the class. You will get points for those other parts, but absolutely not for planning. If I were you, I will identify what do I want to build. What is this? What is this? What is this? FYI, I took a large project for me to say like I'm building an application. You can decide, like I kid you not, I don't mind if you say, no, for me, I have one computer at home and it's a Windows 10 computer. Oh, sorry, taking it back. You can say, you know what? I have, this is my home and uh, this is my little router. I connect it to my computer, a cable, everything has been authorized. Well, technically at home, I don't know who authorized it, but you do you, right? Um, this is your computer and the only thing you're looking for is maybe you're going to, like you have Windows 10, you already have, this is like a Mac device, it's running OS X, but you know what? Uh, Ibrahim said that you must install this software to do ATO and Mac doesn't allow you to do that. Now you have to dual boot on your system. So you're installing another Windows VM within the same machine. I don't care. And even the Windows, you can say, I already had it before, blah, blah, blah. But all I'm doing now is configuring a password. So you're literally telling me you're limiting your authorization boundary to password configuration. Fine by me. All I know is as part of the prepare in this class, you will have to do this. You will have to come up with your own system. What exactly is it that you're building? I think for we all know like she sells cupcake. So in terms of that, we have been saying it in the class. So maybe if you wants to stand up a website for a cupcake, right? Um, then um, you have to come up with a system name. You have to come up with no issue. Um, also come up with an acronym. Like there are a lot of things. You wanna take it further? I mean, come up with even your system UID, like a unique identifier, that would be great. Like you say, maybe MLMS1761, whatsoever you wanna call it because you have many MLMS within Marymount. You do you. I just know at the very minimum, you have to come up with these, All right? You also have to draw this. You might not have to be this fancy or you can take it Picasso way to Really, well, technically, if you do it Picasso way, I cannot read it. I don't know what you're doing. So I have to be able to understand it, but you have to do something and you cannot copy mine, but you can absolutely take inspiration. If you think I'm very inspirational, you can take ideas from how I kind of do that. I will tell you one thing that is very, very, very vital to entire RMF and how we do things is abstractions. It's heavily focused on setting what is the boundary of authorization boundary, but it is also presenting some challenge these days a lot, especially when you start talking about things like Kubernetes, containers, all of this, because they do not, there, has, there is a logical boundary, but there isn't necessarily this boundary that you can say you are thinking of to carve what is the um, logic, not necessarily from a process wise, you can say, okay, Kubernetes, this is where the function ends and this is where the application takes it does, or even other containers. So as technology is advancing, truthfully, I am seeing more and more challenge with this. Even the, the cloud computing where a lot of people are having lately, a lot of issues with identifying what exactly is you know, like we are talking about this virtual machine and now you're putting these different applications in here. A lot of ISSOs and a lot of these agencies that are completely new to cloud, maybe they are only doing just this, but it's super hard to nail down. This is their only boundary, oh, everything here, everything this and this and this is being provided by either Azure or AWS and has been already authorized by FedRAMP one of those, all of those, so they only need to focus on this. The concept is what is really challenging a lot of people, right? So it is absolutely helpful to be able to, and don't get me wrong, it is super, super hard, but it is also helpful to be able to identify authorization boundary because I will tell you one thing, 
physically or maybe visually here, we can see that there is a, uh, um, an authorization or delineation or kind of separation between the two. But when you start looking at it from a logical perspective, operational, there is, there is a definitely some boundary, but it's not like there is a, a, a direct boundary because over here, you are having either system calls, APIs, whatsoever, different kind of integration, right? Like even between the platform and this, you're having pod numbers, right? So where do you, do you just break it here and say, oh, this is this, this is this, right? So it's not like there is no connection, but at the very abstract level, the industry, and this is more of that DOD thing because there is so much kind of from DOD culture that discretionally access, mandatory access, like at these hard lines, like even taking it because they are hev they heavily influence all of these things, like taking it without putting these hard obstructions is quite hard, but logically, I'm telling you that there is none because tell me how if you create a tunnel, this is this maybe uh, some form of you know a reservoir or a water dam, and this is where the river is and it's flowing water. Tell me how do you decide this is the hard boundary because still it's flowing. What made you say this is it? What is the difference with this boundary and this boundary? Similar thing between the platform and this. It's more like an interface that or a pod uh, place, right? Where this pod number, this is the address and information is flowing through it. How do you see this is the boundary? But you have to identify it. Not necessarily from here, but you would say maybe there is some form of connection. Now, if you're inheriting the platform, let's say you are consuming, let's say this is for the sake of an example only, Let's say this is some form of database, right? Maybe Azure SQL. Uh, if anybody wanna give me an example of any uh, platform product that you know within AWS that people are familiar with, I will appreciate it. Um, anybody knows anything from Azure that is at a platform? Any, let's say just any database, right? And you kind of build some custom application that is using the database or whatsoever it still needs to have some form of connectivity between it by pointing it, right? Some form of integration, maybe from a networking perspective, maybe a pod or some form of address or whatever it is that is pointing to it. What you do here is because this has been authorized, right? This is not, your system is not, that also means the connection is not, trust me, around those SI, the system integrity controls, you need to talk about what kind of connection is happening here and how is it secured, right? All of those things. Or rather, if your application is exposing some form of API and connecting to the internet, yeah, maybe still your application is not authorized. Maybe what you're trying to connect to over here is authorized, but this information, how are you securing it? Is it a shared responsibility between you and this? Maybe you're installing some form of, I don't know, if it's at the network layer, VPN capabilities using maybe IPsec and sharing the keys. If it's at the platform application layer, maybe you are looking at it at putting those TLS 1.3. For those of you who don't know that, maybe SSL certificate, right? People still use that. So you don't necessarily have to know these technicalities come from a networking background. So you don't need to know necessarily this technical um, uh, information. That's why you have your engineers to inform you on that, you have your whatsoever, but just at the very least high level, you need to be able to understand at the very high level, the different abstractions are like, you should be able to say, hey, so if this is running within this, and this is here, what is connecting these two? And then they will start like, yeah, logically there is pod numbers. And then if you start talking to those developers because you're not, not talking in their name, like, yeah, there is no difference between you. Like, no, 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 no. AWS is providing this. You are building this. I know they didn't build this. How are the two connecting? Well, they are all kind of the same thing. One is running within the other. There's like one is running inside the, okay, tell me, how are they connecting? I mean, if this is a bow and the egg is inside, how are they, I mean, connected, right? I need to know, tell me. So this is based part of where you have to also 
really kind of as time goes on from experience, you tweak yourself to be able to talk to those engineers in their language. Trust me, they will invest in learning how to speak to you in your language because it's not their problem. It's your problem. You're coming to them with information. So you need to be able to communicate with them. Um, so all of those things, but now maybe I'm scaring you. You don't need to worry about that because if this is your first time and you're thinking into going into that as a career, you will eventually get to that point. If you're only taking the class just to get your A and just meet your requirements because you really don't care about this, doesn't matter. Just do this to me, you and I split our ways. Bye. And for my <laughs> savvy RMF people, I believe this is just normal to you. Any question on this, please? Remove yes, Dr. Ibrahim, I have a question, please. So yes. th this is very good when it comes to like layered, you know, when you are aware of um, how things are integrated. But my question about the recent uh, migration to the cloud for the government agencies, for instance, where you have like software as a service, how would we, how would you do the ATO when you are only limited to the upper layer that you don't know the internals of um, the other layers that they are belong to the provider? Are you going to work with along with them? Are they going to provide you with documentation you need? Or uh, you, you, there are some boundaries that you cannot exceed? Okay, I need you to be patient with me because I'm going to let you answer your question. And it's fine if you don't know. So like an example, first, let's nail down your question. Let's see all of these things that I kind of shaded right now. They are all what is provided by, let's use AWS, for example, right? All of these, they own the data center, they own the internet. All you are having is just access to this so you can build your website, right? Does that answer, like, does that rephrase your question? Are we on the same page on that? Yeah, pretty much you're making, you're tailoring, you know, like kind of like yeah. customizing what's left over, right? Yes, absolutely. But yes, you and I are on the same page. I'm just saying like AWS is providing all, all of these and I'm basically rephrasing your question. And from a visual perspective, by the way, and this is you, right? Right. This is you. Everything that I've kind of highlighted here in red is AWS, agreed? Correct. Okay, how do you, let's answer three questions. One, how do you know in the first place, all those security controls, how do you know which ones apply to you and which one is done by AWS? That's one question. Second, are you going to contact them to get documents? You asked me that, right? It's how like uh, going over their white papers or- oh, you know, Yeah, yeah, I absolutely follow you. Then the third part is, I'm going to ask you a question. Do you agree with me that AWS is a cloud service provider? Yes. Let's assume it's not DOD related because DISA does that and they don't publish it, but let's assume it's the other side. Which organization did we say usually authorize uh, CSP? It's totally fine if you can remember. You said FedRAMP. Do you agree right. with me? Do you agree? So yes. basically FedRAMP is the one who authorized this, right? There are two ways that you will know everything about this. One is you contact FedRAM to give you all the information. Two is you contact AWS to give you all the information. All of which you need to, if it's FedRAM, uh, you might have to come from the government side. If it's a commercial sector, you have to use maybe your organization email or whatsoever to request it. But let me even tell you how you can go and request it from FedRAM side. Give me just a second to open my browser. Thank you. Sure thing. FedRAM maintains a list of all the service providers that they have authorized. You go to a place called, hold on, give me just a second. You go to a place called, um, uh oh, what's going on? Great, so you go to Edron Marcus, please. Over here, 
you will see all the providers, including AWS. So let's say what uh, the system we are talking about is around that AWS um, package. There are multiple packages for AWS. So let's say, you see, there is the government cloud. Which one are we talking about? So let's say is the East-West, right? It's already been authorized at moderate level. You go in here, all their products. Wait, hold on, why is it taking forever? Give me a second. Really? I don't know why. I'm supposed to be able to go in here. Okay, great. So, you see? And then you will tell you like, okay, uh, infrastructure as a service or platform as a service is the public cloud, not the government cloud, meaning government agencies cannot use that. But guess what? Look at it. Package access request form. You see that? And then you can access it. You might have to request for it. It might ask you to provide your government address or email. So which means it has to come from that. You see, if you're a federal contractor, please review this. You finished, okay, you must have a .gov or .mail email address to access this package. You finish this, and it will tell you where to submit it, I believe. Signature, agreement, all of those things, blah, blah, blah. And there has to be like, if you are to read this, I believe it will tell you how to get it. Again, you absolutely need to use a government email and also someone maybe within your organization. If you are the AO or maybe high level authority, you might be able to use that. Um, if you have like a PIV card or something like that, you might be able to use that. If you don't know what a PIV card is, just a government badge, I guess, <laughs> uh, for DOD background, we'll say CAT, right? So does this, right? So you might have to use a PIV card to access it. Possibly if it's that of FedRAM, but I know from AWS directly, if you reach out to AWS instead of going through this process, they will give you access to the package using a portal. I can't remember what they call it, but yeah. So it's also within AWS, it will tell you how many tools, like because there are so many services, I think there, there are so many services. Yeah, it's telling you which of the services have been authorized to be at, uh, public cloud, to be used by the public cloud. So all of this, I don't know what is it? Amazon Aurora or server, all of this. If you want to see another package, you can just check it, right? Uh, let's see, we use like Microsoft, Azure. So you see, these are like the micro commercial cloud. There is also the 365 for emails, whatever. It has to be authorized. It's the main one the government uses. Um, the multi-tenants, Azure government, including the dynamics, all of that. Right, same thing, you see? Or you can go to Microsoft straight. I can tell you which theme, they will give you access. And these are all of it, Azure database or whatsoever. So switching back real quick to this, um, give me a second. So switching back to this, as we mentioned, all of this, uh oh, give me a second, cool. All of this, we mentioned have been authorized and would serve including this. Let's say this is uh, a platform as a service uh, application that is provided maybe Aurora. There is a sub AWS tool called Aurora, right? I just saw it. So if it, this is meant to be Aurora, is it authorized? Yes, maybe it's authorized for use within the public, but not within the government. So you say yes. AWS is authorized, but that product or that service, you cannot use it. If we want to take it a different approach, give me just a second um, here. Let's say all of this, including this, is a SaaS product. By a SaaS product, I mean software as a service, like maybe your um, Office 365 or even Microsoft Word, right? That is provided by Microsoft. Obviously, underlying there is all of this, and you need to use this without even building it or whatsoever. It depends who is using it. Is this the government? Yes. Government civilian side? Yes. Has FedRAM authorized it for government use or only for commercial use? So all of those things. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes, Dr. Very, very, very detailed. Thank you so much. Sure then. Any other question on yeah, this? Professor, Professor, actually, mm -hmm. I'd like to make a comment related okay. to this. Earlier this evening, I posted a link in the chat window of a 
what's a brand new um, online offering from NIST. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a um, introductory course on the risk management framework. And I just put it out there because I know for people that aren't used to doing this kind of work that you're showing here, uh, th this is a pretty, pretty, uh, you know, tough, tough slog. So uh, I just shared that uh, in the in the chat window, and it was just announced, I think, in the last day or two, actually. And uh, Ron oh, Ross himself the, was, I think, it was a Twitter message he sent. Oh, that's nice. I I missed the announcement. I think they updated it to that um, to include the planning, right? The old one was like two hours without the planning, but that is absolutely absolutely correct. I don't know. I yeah. didn't realize even if on Canvas I didn't put the link. Sometimes I usually put the link to that two hour. But please, 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 like no jokes. If it's not in there, first thank you so much, John, and then second, please, please, please. Actually, oh. remind us if you check on Canvas and it's not there, but go and look into that. Okay. I think it's like two hours. Please go and watch it. Yeah, I'll put it. I'll put it in there again. Yeah, that would be really, really great. I used to put like the two hour video and then I started to realize the old one is really old because it's going to confuse people. So I'm like, yeah, I will take it back. So truly appreciate you letting us know that Ron Ross announced um, a new one on Twitter. That is uh, really helpful. Thank you. Any question on this before we take a break and then we come back and we do the first step of everything. No questions? All right, let's take uh, eight minutes and come back exactly at eight, please. Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, we'll be here if you wanna chat or you have a question. Yep. Yes. Yes. So, is it safe to say that we are done with the prepare step based on how I went through it? We, I know we did not identify with ATO documentation types, it's going to apply to this class, but we have already fleshed those requirements in Canvas as well as in this same slide towards the end. So we'll touch upon it. Any question on, the, on this step before I go in depth? Cool. So step one, what is categorization? So why do we need to categorize? Actually, give me a second, please. I need to see something. Okay, great. Why do we need to categorize? We now know our system. We have identified all of those systems, uh, everything that applies to it, like those architectural, architectural diagrams, the boundary, authorization boundary, all of those things, who is the SO, IO, or whatsoever, right? But then we also need to know what is the categorization based on the system sensitivity? Is it going to be a high system, low system, uh, moderate system? Is it going to be IO2, four, five, six, right? But basically what we're trying to achieve with this categorization is to understand the overall risk that we, that the system, um, basically the overall risk related to the system around sensitivity, around confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So let me give you a high level example. Earlier, I believe, uh, I can't remember who asked me a question on um, relating to FedRAMP. Was it Norris, was it you, I think? You asked the question around how do we get access to the federal uh, resources, packages, and whatnot, right? Yes, doctor. Cool. So when federal authorizes, I don't know if you can remember on the side, but you will see that federal will say, okay, AWS is authorized to uh, add maybe, say, Gov Cloud, meaning it's going to be used within the US Gov, right? But then it will say, like, okay, it's going to be at FedRAM high or low, or mod, sorry, or moderate or low, right? If you are not, if you are looking at it from DOD, it's maybe IL6, IL5, IL4, and IL2. Three and one, that's a different story. We have consolidated into something else. But yeah, um, let's focus on this side a little bit. So for federal agencies as well, you will have this high, low, and moderate. 
but how do you determine if your system is considered a very high system or it's going, sorry, just a high system, not a like very, if it's a high system or a low or a moderate system or a low system, a lot of things goes into the picture. One quick thing that I'm going to ask, what is one thing that you will first need to look into as you are trying to categorize? Like what should be, like what comes to mind, assuming there is no way to do it, right? Like you don't, you as the risk professional, you don't have any guidance or whatsoever, but based on what we keep talking about in this class, what should be something that you should instantly look into to say, as you are trying to identify the risk that will apply to a system? What would you look into? The, the, the impact of, of the, sorry, sorry. Uh, the sensitivity of the data. Okay, someone said sensitivity of the data. Okay, another person. The the impact that lead to the damage, of, you know, a, a comprehensive. That leads to the okay, any other person? Uh, Doctor Waziri, one thing that I had to come across was uh, information system types. Yeah, go on. I'm sorry, go ahead. The the agency that this was for. Uh, I remember when I was doing something for DISA. It had to be FedRAM high, and then for GSA, it was just a low. Okay, agency four. Someone said information. Can uh, everybody please go on me? Someone said information system. Someone said sensitivity of data. Someone said impact that uh, leads to uh, damage. Any other person? Classification of data. Yeah, yeah. classification of data. Um, Sensitivity of data, can I add it here? Class slash sensitivity of data, any other thing? What about the impact to the business if it's um, not available? Impact to the business, anyone? Likelihood. Uh, yeah, can everybody please go unmute? Uh, likelihood of, just likelihood of what? likelihood of uh, the impact occurring. Okay, so can we limit it to around the impact since you're looking at the likelihood of the impact? I agree, um, likelihood. Great. I really, really, really like these responses, but I even like this two better. Agency for, and not necessarily the impact only, but to the business. Why do we see business? Government-wise, you will not hear like word like business, but we have our terminology, right? We will say maybe agency's mission. Is that okay? I was about to say that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like what's the mission of the agency, right? We keep talking about it in this class. And don't get me wrong, it's fine. What I mean by it's fine, if you don't get it, it's a very common thing when a lot of people are categorizing systems within the government. Before they even stand up the system, they basically you know like, yeah, I just want to do federal moderate, maybe because the ISSO just feels like he knows more of moderate controls. I don't even know, but some of them really make up their minds. But it's a huge oversight. A lot tend to forget the focus of the business. And agency or org mission, which is basically the, th the same thing, focus of business and agency and augmentation. It drastically change what you do and you would see it as we are going through it. Now, to change a little bit on, sorry, to go further beyond this, I 100% agree with everything everybody said, all of those impact, sensitivity, of the data, type of users, all of those things, I 100% agree with it. They all come after this. Focus of the business and agency organization or organization's mission, okay? Now, based on the agency and the mission, we put in all of those data types, right? Or information type around what kind of information are we holding in the system or are we using the system for, or is the system providing or whatever it is, right? What kind of business or information does the system provide, right? What is the system meant to do, right? And then we identify it. And then we have all of these nice documents from NIST that tells us when you put this and this and this together and it's going to be something else. 
and we are going to do it, just touching on the lecture side of things now. Okay, based on this, we agreed that this is all it is, right? Now, how will it drastically change based on the organization missions? Sorry, the org mission slash business focus, which basically is the same thing. And I keep telling you since the beginning of the class, everything you do, make sure it's aligned with this and this. How does it add value to the organization? Very important. Takes a while to agree with that, but super important. How does this change the, literally the sensitivity of the system? Keep this here, we are gonna come back to it. For the NIST RMF, you're going to look at your information type and we're going to look at them, right? But I'm going to make up one right now. Let's say we have patient records on the system and they are what? Health information, right? Or health data. You look at it from these security tenants that we talk about, CIA, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Let us say, you know what? I'm going to change it from health information because it will not allow me to whatsoever. Let's say um, I'm going to come up with another one that I can switch hats instantly without much impact. Uh, educational information, just education, right? Meant to educate someone. We're going to look at it from confidentiality, impact, and availability. Next, when you have to look up maybe educational information, they already have recommendations that they will give you, what NIST recommend. They will say, well, it's education related, so the confidentiality should be low because it's meant for public consumption, but that is NIST assuming. The integrity should maybe be moderate because you want to make sure people are getting the right education, right? Not necessarily something that has been uh, changed. And uh, the availability should definitely be high, accessible to everybody. This maybe is just NIST recommendation. Let's stick with NIST recommendation and I'll come back to you. Uh, to that later. So when you put all of this, how do you decide like, oh, this system, our system MLMS that is meant to hold this education information, not your personal records, but just educational information. Maybe Ibrahim published a certain type of research. Maybe I publish your research, right? And MLS, MLMS is holding it, which is my system from earlier, right? My remote learning management system. We agree with this. This is what NIST recommend. I look at this. There is a formula that allows you me to say the entire system is at this one of this sensitivity level. Based on this, if this is so confusing to you, but basically you're looking at confidentiality, what's the impact? We mentioned that it's low. So over here, we have it as low. Integrity, what is the impact? We said it's moderate, so we have it as moderate. Availability is high, we said we have it as high. Good. I want to tell you something. And I already wrote it here. Don't go thinking like, oh, when you have L times M times H, or maybe the root of L times M times H, or maybe the exponential of, no, please, just, no, take it easy, just, Look at this impact level, which one is the highest? And that is the overall for the system. And we are going to do it. Now, please, 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 please listen to this. This is applicable to NIST RMF and FedRAM process, right? Even within US government, once you start going into like the DOD site that uses CNSS I-1253, it looks at things a little bit slightly different. Yes, it does the overall categorization as high, but you are going to look at additional things in terms of how you classify your system. It's different. Let's not even bring the IC community into this. Theirs is just all agency specific. But for NIST, all federal agencies, they look at it this way. If you are learning NIST RMF and federal RMF, I don't care what, formulation you have here, if there is one high, it's the biggest, go for it. Or rather it's the highest, go for it. If you have everything as low, 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 moderate, it becomes the highest one. Keep in mind, this is for only one information type. You can have 10 information types and we will go through how to do it. Now, here is why I started with 
make sure you look at the org mission and the business focus. We said it's education information. Let's say the organization here is Marymount University because they own this MLMS. Perfect, we did a research. A brand did a research on that. It makes sense. NIST said low, moderate, high. Maybe Marumont agrees with NIST or Marumont said, mm, no, I don't agree with, my, with that. I would like the availability to just be moderate because if we put it at availability high, maybe we need to also build another redundant system that requires us to keep the copy of information elsewhere, making more cost and whatsoever. So we are just going to turn this to moderate, moderate, moderate. As such, the system is no longer high, it's moderate. Keep in mind, NIST only recommends agencies have the ability to change it. Good, but this is for Marymount. Again, I haven't given the example of how this, if you don't look at this, it will drastically change. I said Marymount, it makes sense. We agreed for NIST recommendation, NIST rec equals to high. Marymount, based on what we just did, we agreed like, yeah, it's going to be moderate because it saves us money. But let's assume completely, it's not even Marymount. Now this entire system, just the same thing. Do you know why we are sending this? At the Defense Academy. It is DOD related. Ibrahim's research is literally going to be US cybersecurity strategy from an implementation viewpoint which makes literally this research very, very, very sensitive. And the confidentiality has instantly turned into high. Integrity is high. Availability is instantly low. Look at how I'm writing it all in huge caps. Let me even clean it and write it in caps. Just so, so I'm screaming. You know how you send text in like caps whatsoever? All right, in tech, com, uh, confidentiality is high, right? Integrity is absolutely high. It must be accurate. We cannot take uh, whatsoever. And availability is low. If there's anything less than low, we actually want it as even lower than whatsoever because we don't want it accessible that much. Only authorized officials will have access to this research that we did that is going to define US cybersecurity strategy or on the offensive side or on the defense side, because access to this research literally exposes us, right? As such, just the fact that it's the same type of system, it's the same everything, but because we have switched from Marymount to the Defense Academy, which is maybe an academy on the DOD that does a, let's even use DAPA, because DAPA does a lot of DOD research. So we switch to DAPA, you can see how it impacts that. But again, next recommendation is still there. So please, 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 always look into the organization mission or business focus, right? When you look at it from here, what is Marimont's organization mission? Let's, let's keep the profit side away. It's the etiquette, right? DAPA, <laughs> DAPA side, what is the primary responsibility of that DAPA? Their mission on whatsoever is to do research for who? DOD. Definitely changes what Marymount is meant to do in terms of DOD, right? Cool. So any question on this before I switch into how we are going to look at this document, this document, this document, basically this document and this document, they kind of just said everything I say, but still go ahead and read them because it's going to give you another perspective beyond mine and it's going to educate you. And one of these documents provide the list of the information types, which we're going to look into them and then select. Example of information type is when I just said education information, right? So now we are going to look at MLMS. We also identify that the organization is Marymount based on my own planning, right? So we are going to look at the educational sector. We're going to look at what MLMS do. What is the description of MLMS learning management? Is it if we don't have that information type, we can look at what type of information does it hold. Okay, student records. Is there any personal identifier maybe in here around your address, name, whatsoever, including payroll? Possibly, yes, maybe not. Let's just go there and make some few things up, right? Keep in mind, this is my way. You cannot do exactly what I do. You have to go use this. 
collaborate with others on this. I agree, you can work with others in the class so long as I know you do it, right? Totally fine with me. Learn from others, but you have to do it. Um, Professor, I have a question. Yeah, what other what? Uh, so with okay. respect to the, the Marymount LMS, w wouldn't it be fair to argue that the, the integrity impact is high and, and not just because of the potential for PII, but also because you're handling in that system student performance and grades and any any errors in that would be a serious uh, breach, if you will. That is a very good example. If you feel that and you think that applies to the system, that's another good reason why you should not follow NIST and then you select what you think. If you say integrity is high because of this, 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 you say integrity is high because of this, this, this. Nothing is written in stone. That's why you have to look at it from how it impacts you or the organization, right? Basically how it impacts the organization, not necessarily you. But if you are in a position of, like you're the system owner or ISO, so you make that judgment call. Yes, that's why okay. this recommends. And right. even the template I gave here, including like temp, uh, program templates, they allow you to tweak and change from this approach to your own method like your own um, selections, and then you provide a justification for that. Why don't we go into it and then we see it all? Does that work with everybody? Sure, Dr. Cool thing. Okay, so I'm being lazy. I'm not gonna put any logo, but you know what this means. And if you see this, please delete it. Follow this template word for word. But before I even go for this, let me show you these documents from the slide. There is the fifth 199 document, which set the tone at a very high level of how to even do categorization. Everything I mentioned, it's going to be discussed in here, right? Like it talks about, hold on, the purpose of it, purpose of doing even the categorization, how, how it applies, the categorization of information and information system types, like what is confidentiality, integrity, availability, the potential impact on organizations and individuals, like all of those things that you need to be looking into before um, you make a call, right? It says like if the potential impact is low, then you look at it from this angle. If it's moderate, again, if it is high, you look at it. Then the security categorization, how it applies to the different information types, right? We just mentioned uh, from our example, an example of information type is the educational, information we measure, right? This is similar to the slide. You just look at them. Basically, at the end, you will select the overall one, okay? And then the security categorization applied to the system is just basically the same thing, Why right? We tell you the highest value is this, and it's given a bunch of examples and all of that. I'm not gonna read this, but you should, okay? Now, there is the volume one here. Question, question Dr. Rain, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. um, so speaking of this, the impact, you know, the information type here, um, obviously one of these, if it's the highest, it will set the overall uh, level of impact. But mm -hmm. in cases when you have like a debate, whether it's moderate or high, uh, because eventually it will increase the cost and this is needs to be addressed, you know, and finalized, who mm -hmm. is the ultimate um, like, solution advisor on that who's going to give the final word you know whether it's going to go moderate or high because eventually it will it will impact everything with with it is designed by the AO but if the AO is smart enough he will lean on his entire team from the system owner the people that are using it and if the organization is for profit and the system is going to be highly costly if we put it at high we might not get any return and all of those things then now you are bringing in those people with financial knowledge to help you do the analysis that is around those cost benefit analysis right if you're looking at it from the government side where there's really no profit as much you're looking at it more from that business impact analysis and you look at all of those things but ultimately ultimately it's part of the ato process the ao has the final say on everything but i can tell you this a smart ao will not make the decision themselves only they will lean on their iso the a um the system owner, the different teams to kind of come up with how do we make the um, educated guess, right? Or at least not even guess, an educated um, arrangement or agreement of what should be the 
categorization or the um, sensitivity of the system. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Thank you. Cool. Um, so this is another document just around, it just talking to you more on those different information types. Volume two provides the information types and you will see that. Again, uh, let me just go to the table of content. I will recommend you read kind of like the introduction, always, always, most of this documentation, definitely read those um, introductions. They tend to get repetitive, but it's constantly ingrained that thinking at the organization and high level, not necessarily limited scope, right? So even with categorization, look at it from the bigger picture, how it impacts the um, organization, right? There's security categories and the potential type of losses around the confidentiality, integrity, and whatsoever, how to identify the systems. You see identification of mission-based information system. Why did they start with that? Why didn't they start with management and support? Why is it mission-based? Exactly, organization-wide. So look into those different impact levels, but it's also documented in FIFA 99. And then how to make adjustments. Right, review provisional impact levels and adjust slash uh, finalize information types. Over here is just going to talk to you about making sure you just don't follow NIST blindly, but you tailor or scope it or adjust it or finalize it based on mission, all of those things. Assign system security category. This is taking the overall part, right? And then you need to document the process. Documentation, we are going to do one now, but there are multiple, multiple ways of doing it. I have seen some organization put in some really nice templates that you don't even need to do the overall categorization. You just select it and it tells you one, some, especially like FedRAM, do you follow this word document where you put everything, you make the judgment call. Some will even automate it using a tool like say EMAS, Exacta, RSC Archer. I don't think RSC Archer supports NIST RMF, but I do not know, okay? So what are those information types? Like I just pulled one out of thin air and say educational information. Where do we get them? We get them from here. There are a lot of them that NIST provided. You see up to 304 pages. That's because you see, they started with looking at it from organizational mission focus, starting with like service delivery. You see the different type whatsoever. So let's go to the educational side of things. Um, trying to see like supply chain. Uh, by the way, you can be like in defense and national security, but you also pull certain information because the system is like defense and national security might impact the system that is meant to handle their supply chain, right? So. Yes, you look at it based on defense and national security, but then you apply this based on, um, you apply the information type based on supply chain, and then you tweak it to fit national security or defense, right? All of those things. I'm trying to see if there is the education sector here. Okay, education is the information type related to elementary, higher education. Okay, they only have a generic higher uh, education. Let me click here. You see, what is the recommendation for this? All of this, they said confidentiality should be low, integrity should be low, availability should be low. Overall, the system should be low. But here is the thing, it does not mean that. It says the confidentiality level is the effect of unauthorized disclosure of higher education information on the ability of responsible agencies to support education beyond secondary level, right? Example, military, all of those things. But based on the example I give you, it can literally change it to from moderate to high or whatsoever, because in such cases, Sorry, exceptions are based on the mission supported by the external training and educational activity. In such cases, the impact on the system is defined by the information associated with the support mission, supported mission. It can change, so nothing is written. A lot of things as you go through it. But then again, on my part, I look at this higher education information, that is not the only thing my system is collecting. My system is also collecting payroll related information. So just a second, me being, Taking a, let me see if there are things related to payroll. Right. Is there an information type related to payroll? Compensation management information type. I wonder which one is it? Which sector? Give me a second. Maybe like our ADT system is under that. So, human resource management. Yes, of course, Marymount is an educational institution, but there is also the HR department. And I need information type related to the HR, right? but I am not still using this information type based on 
generic HR um, mission. Rather, I'm looking at how does the information type affect me and the system and Marimount, obviously, before even um, the system. Okay, let's go into the document, try to gather one or two information types, put it in there and categorize it, okay? I'm not going to fill everything, but I'm going to talk about it. Logo, just put a logo there. If in my case, based on my organization, it's going to be Marimount's logo or the IT department logo. Organization name, I'm going to change it to Marimount. What is the system name? What's my system name? Anybody? MLS. MLS. Thank you, but at least- MLS. Yep, Marimount Learning Management System, right? So, who is Levin? Huh? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Learning management system. Dave, I will need to connect with you to cut that email, worker emails address from the video. Anyway, um, learning management, uh, okay, system categorization, right? So that is my system, we'll put the date. Oh, look at it, then template allows to do that, cool. Um, prepared by who built this document? A lot of the times you find a lot of SIs being like contractors are the ones putting it together, but at the same time, it could be the organization or whatsoever, right? So let's, let, I can use my old organization as they're the ones who build this document. So let's say the light build it, right? What's their address, the room number, this, come up with yours. Who is it prepared for? In my situation, like for our system MS, who is the organization? Asking anybody in the class, just let IT me know. department? No, not really. Marymount IT yeah. department. Marymount is the organization, right? Yeah. Marymount is the organization, but nothing stops us from saying like Marymount University and IT department. There is nothing, it's just to be more specific. This is not important. Put the address, Boston, all of those things. I mean, the address and zip, these are all templates. Every organization will have its own. I assure you, like when I look at it from the IC community, good luck having this. Just sit straight and zip and stay. Yeah, it's not gonna be there. Um, okay, what is the information system name? My remind whatsoever, what is the abbreviation? We said it's MLMS. You are going to fill all of this in your template. You have access to this template as well and you're going to do it. Please keep in mind, just update this, like the version numbers and just update this information types just for clarity. And uh, <coughs> so, um, what is the general description on function? I believe I wrote some, some of mine since I already did it during my planning. I'm going to be lazy and copy and paste it for you guys, but I will presume you are going to come up with yours. Oh, I don't want this capitalized. I do not want it capitalized. Oh, look at that. Okay, so, oh, what kind of font is this? Anyway, um, information system owner and security officer. Again, who is the owner? It was, uh, I believe we had it as Waziri-SO and this is Waziri-SO, right? I'm not gonna fill the rest of the information, come up with yours. In my case, this is the title, is system owner, ISSO, organization, Marimount, Marimount, address, same thing, right? Email address, come up with one, please don't use your personal or anything like that, nothing sensitive, just the one come up with Anakin or Stowers or Stowers that come out again. AO, I am the AO. Look at it, I already have the information there. Yeah, I gave you guys this template, but I'm beginning to dislike it. Um, Actually, that's a good pain to pass on to you guys because some organizations will pass on a more horrible template. Anyway, <laughs> so this is the fun part. What I'm going to do is, please let me know if this is not clear or it's not gonna help you if I decide to do this split screen so I can just refer to it. I just want to fill this information. Okay, we first said that we are going to look like uh, for the educational part. At least I have some nice um, spreadsheet that collected all of the information without having to go through this document. Some reason I lost it, so. Oh. so let's look at educational side. Oh, okay, cool. The higher education. Um, that will be, you know what? I'm just going to use this to just pre-populate the information before I go to it. So this is the reference. 
what is the information type? We said higher education, right? Uh, I will populate this in a bit. It's just trying to collect some few ones of them here that are applied to us, right? Let's say our system, it's also collecting, um, trying to just go through to see if there's anything that apply to us without me having to hit my brain hard. Uh, personal identity and authentication information can there's not necessarily authenticated plot, but let's, let's just use it for the sake of for so let's say you're keeping your also authenticator mechanism within it. So another thing that could apply to us is what trying to like when you think of MLMS like Canvas, what do you think of if there's anything? So is it a software development, not lifecycle, um, information security, information type, not necessarily input. Well, if we're keeping personal identity and authentication mechanisms like say passwords, yeah, you know what? No, I'm not gonna put it. Information management, information type. I'm going to put information management because it's an information management, right? Information management. I'm also going to add information sharing because it allows us to collaborate, right? Sharing. What is the uh, reference for information sharing? 6.3.5.9. What is information management? It is C357. What is the personal identity and authentication? Oh, did I just miss that? Okay, C. By the way, this is just based on how I present this FedRAM. So please, please, please condition yourself to be flexible to accommodate different ways of doing this. Some organizations will give you in, a, in an Excel sheet. Just because we did it in class using this process does not mean, don't learn it based on the template. Learn it based on how it is done. Please, please, please. Because I assure you, not everybody will give you like this. And this is not necessarily the best. Some might have a better optimized way of doing it. I mean, some might even have this like as, as a drop down where you're just selecting it. So, okay, let's go to the first one. Or rather, let me just quickly search this. D, one, two, two. Okay. What did NIST recommend? The security categorization based on NIST recommendation, you see? What did they say for confidentiality? Low, I'm just going to be lazy and put just the initials. Low, and availability is low. This is missed recommendation. Um, now, let's go to D2.8.9. Oh, oh, it's C, okay. C2, okay. What did NIST recommend? Moderate, moderate, moderate. Well, this is not interesting. Okay, moderate, moderate, moderate. And then the next one is C 3.5.7. What is that? 3.5.7. Okay, where are you? We have low, moderate, low. Okay. Again, looking at it from here, right? Again, I'm just looking at NIST recommendations before I switch to the main template, right? Okay, then the last one is 0.9. And we have it as, oh, why does the security categorization say it's not applicable, not applicable? Well, I'm just going to say it doesn't apply, doesn't list, and then I am going to update it for us. Okay, now we have captured all of this. I will just close this and enlarge this so everybody follows, okay? So what is our system? MLMS. Do you have to follow that of NIST? Absolutely not. Why? Because we need to make sure everything here relates to this. Higher education, NIST says it's low, low, low. Do I agree with that? Uh, the confidentiality, since I'm Marymount, maybe higher education, this is actually very vague in the information. It could be a website, it could be whatsoever. So I'm just going to just, for the sake of this, I'm going to say the higher education information type is around curriculum and all of those things, right? That is being used to educate all open source information. So yes, I will agree with NIST, so I'm not changing it. Personal identity and authentication. NIST recommends 
confidentiality, integrity, and availability. I absolutely do not want to limit it to that because we are teaching like RMF and maybe this is class is focused on telling and teaching um, students that are more on that IC community, DOD community. Yes, it is Mariman doing it, but the class is entirely focused on teaching those sensitive students, right? Maybe clear students that they, we don't need to have their identity out there. I'm not saying other students' identity should be out there, but at the same time, this carries more weight because maybe we don't even want to begin associating like, oh, the students, we already know like the students that teach this, sorry, we already know like Maybe because it's a public fund, like DOD has allocated some funds to Marymount, and that must be public information since it's taxpayers' money, for Marymount to educate some of their RMF staffs, right? They are all highly uh, cleared people with so much responsibility, and we absolutely will not want them, like, their information to be out there, but still it is Marimon. But as we come down a little bit beyond Marimon, we're looking at it from even the type of users. We know like, hmm, they are sensitive users. So we don't want their personal identity out there. Moderate is not enough for me. I want to put it at high, very high, because maybe if I put it at high, there could be a security control requirement that even says, do not use the same type of canvas with those that are at the moderate classification, right? the integrity of their information. And I mean, it's not like, it's just their name or whatsoever, who cares? There's not like anybody's going to go in there and change their identity or like the authentication mechanisms or anything. Or maybe, yeah, this recommends integrity to be moderate, but like, I don't know, I can change um, Jacob Vargas name, but he's still Jacob and it doesn't impact how he's taking the class, right? Maybe, maybe Jacob, prefers just to have his initials instead of the full names and he can just go in there and edit it himself and switch it to GV, right? Or maybe Mac will want to have MW, right? Or I can have whatever. So I don't care about making sure the integrity around just the name, just that personal identity relating to name is uh, in, um, at moderate. And I'm just limiting it to name right now, just for ease. There could be a lot of things. Once you start bringing in like social or Marimond ID or whatsoever, that could literally change it, right? So just narrow it to make it things. I'm going to switch it to like, eh, I don't care about that. The availability, Mar uh, Marimond says, sorry, NIST recommends moderate. No, absolutely not. I'm switching it to high. I change the moderate from moderate to high um, and also from this to this. Why am I doing that? statement for this. We can make a statement like, uh, due to the type of students, I'm taking this the easy way. Please, you might have to be very detailed as you are doing it like for work, but I'm just using simple language here. So we can say due to the type of um, students in the class, or maybe due to the type of students, student, used within the system. So like that, that sounds like a terrible language, but anyway, um, within the system. To, uh, changing the, okay. Um, confidentiality of MLLS, sorry, the confidentiality of personal identity from moderate to high, because we would like to ensure that the name of the student is this is a very just simple uh, justification, okay? This is one, but did I change another thing? Yes, I did. Uh, what was it? Integrity from moderate to no. Again, maybe we changed integrity from moderate to low. Allow 
headings, change the headings or whatsoever, right? And because it does not present, because it does to the student record. Okay. The record start in MLMS. So things like that, right? So you have to provide a justification for why you're changing this to this. I can't remember earlier who asked me a question of like, what if, uh, because of the nature of research or what was it? I can't remember the question and I was saying like, yeah, that's a good justification. So yes, if you identify that information type and you want to treat it from here to here, uh, from moderate to high or whatsoever, you will do that, right? So again, let's look at this. Management information, uh, information management. I'm not changing anything, right? And then I'll provide a justification for why not. Information sharing. I absolutely want the information being shared to be uh, confidential, so it should be high. It should the integrity should be quite um, confidential as well, right? It has to be secured, so high. And then the availability of the information, maybe it's related to research or whatsoever. I will just put it at low. Again, provide those justification. So looking at this. Um, give me a second, let me do something to this template so we can have everything in one page if possible. Uh oh, hmm. trying to get the word document into one page without really impacting the visibility. Now I'm going to delete this. Do not delete it in your, in your space. <laughs> okay, let's do this. So, Dr. Weiser, just so I'm understanding and tracking everything, um, we pick an organization of our own and uh, we fill out the information type and compare it to what this is uh, recommending and how we may fill it. When you when you start picking the select impact level, this is all your opinion of how you analyzed it or is there anything else you were going off of, of how you analyze if it was a high, low or medium uh, to you? Like, how, how did you come up with this? Is this just how you felt like it was applied to your organization? Nope. I came up with this because I looked into what is MLS, uh, MLMS organization mission, right? Like, what is Maramon meant to achieve? And then also, what kind of information are we storing in there? As well as what, um, how should, what should be the impact level for those information? That is why we said it is for Marymount, right? And then mm -hmm. we look at higher education, but then also when we come down a little bit, what kind of information is the system holding? So it's holding higher education information, it's holding personal identity, mm -hmm. these student records, it's holding information management, it contains information sharing. And this could be a much higher list if you have a bigger system. If you look at maybe say a system that is holding COVID related stuff, it could be health related information, but there will be no personal information because it's just a website to provide um, just COVID related tracking information, right? If you look at it for maybe um, immigration related where it's holding visas, passport records and whatsoever, it changes this, right? Now you are holding into travel related information, visa records, uh, personal identity, absolutely. Oh. Uh, Kind of no, we pick we pick any organization and we just fill out the template with the uh, information type and reference and all that good stuff. Right. Any organization of our choice? Yeah, I mean, so long as it is aligned with your initial information. Oh, oh, did I delete this? Oh snap! Hold on. So long as it is aligned with this, uh, yeah. Remember, like I have a system description. I don't know if you missed the part of the class, but I had this right. Like all of the basic details where I talk about, this is my system. This is what it's meant to serve. This is the name of the system. So it's a learning management system. That is what MLMS is. This is my example. So on your part, it's fine with me. If you want to come up with like a health record system, fine by me. If you want to come up with whatever type of system it is, just let me know what it is and let your information types that you're selecting reflect that system. 
right? So when you look at information sharing, one could say, how does a learning management system relate to information sharing? If it doesn't make sense to you, so be it. If it makes sense to you, because on my part, like I was saying, hmm, learning management system, I can use it as similar to like Dropbox, where I'm going in there, dropping their templates and assignment requirements, and they are picking it up, right? But I will absolutely want the integrity to be high because right now I'm saying, uh, do this, do this homework, and the grade is going to be five. I don't want anybody to go in and say, yeah, the grade should be 10 points. That's not in line with the integrity, right? That's been um, messed up with. As such, I will want the integrity to be high, meaning nobody should at least have it easy to change the integrity or impact. <coughs> oh, but then okay. you know, I'm changing it, I need to upgrade. Does that make sense? No, I understand everything you're saying, but there was something that you showed, and I know you went over the class, I was paying attention. Is that, I know we, I know there's a template that we submit on there, but there was another thing that you just showed that had to break down the system and they yeah. said, why well, isn't there ISO and all that stuff? Um, yeah. Do you want us to submit anything of that information or are we just submitting just so what's on this? So sorry, just a second. Due to interest of time, why don't I quickly finish the main thing here and then we touch on those questions. Does that work for you? Yeah, that sounds good. Perfect, thanks. Um, so yeah, you fill out all of these things, right? Like your justification. Obviously, I should have one here, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to copy this and paste it. Just tap. Oh, I'm not even going to do that. There has to be a justification, right? A justification for why we are changing it. A good justification is how I mentioned right now. I don't want anyone to change the grade. It's going to affect the impacts and whatsoever. That could be the reason why I'm saying no, it's apl it applies to me and at a high level. Okay, looking at this. Based on what we mentioned earlier, whatever is highest is considered highest. For this information tab, you look at low, 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 right? These three, ignore the next part. These three, they are all low. Is it okay for me to say here I have it as low? Over here, we look high, low, high. I can say, oh, this system is at high. Uh, sorry, that system, information tab is at high. The uh, information management is low, moderate, low. I can say the highest is moderate. And over here I have high, high, low, and the overall is at high. Now, for all of this, high is the highest. That sounds nice to say, high is the highest. Anyway, so what is the overall sensitivity level for MLMS? It's going to be high. So, because now the overall sensitivity is high, which means what? MLMS is classified as, um, the categorization for MLMS is at the high level. If this is a system that a cloud service provider is going to build and maybe provide it as SaaS whatsoever, and they want to maybe host it say within, actually, let's take a step back. Let's say this is a system that is going to be used within, um, DOD educational sector, maybe Defense Academy or something like that, that is going to be used. We already know that DOD must use um, these uh, requirements, right? And um, whatsoever. And um, actually, DOD is a bad example because DOD will use impact levels. I will switch it to say maybe this system is created by uh, an educational sector within the government. Let's say Department of Health have their own school, right? The school, just a school a higher education school for the Department of Health. And they are the ones standing up this system. We know the system is at high and we know they need to um, use some form of maybe cloud environment to host it. Any cloud environment that is going to host this um, system, MLMS, must be at the high level. Who authorizes cloud environments for government usage? civilian side, FedRAMP. So if this, uh, if the cloud provider is say Microsoft Azure, is it okay for us to say Microsoft Azure must be FedRAMP high authorized? How would we know if Microsoft Azure is FedRAMP high authorized? We go to FedRAMP marketplace as we went to earlier, right? Like over here, give me a second. Actually, uh, we go to 
marketplace, right? We will get access to those package. Uh, is Microsoft Azure authorized as Fedram High? We will see now. This is taking some time. Okay, let's see. This is one way to get access to the package. So we have the government cloud, right? Is it authorized at high? Yep, it is, you see? So it's federal authorized high, but let's even go into it a little bit. This is really taking time. Hmm. But as you can see, okay, great. So it is, the deployment model is for the government community cloud. So the government sector can have it, can be used. Um, it's authorized at high. It, it received authorization since 2020 April, right? So as you can see, all good, which means we are now allowed to use Azure um, government cloud, right? The government community cloud, because it's authorized at this. But also within the Azure environment, what other systems are we standing up like storage whatsoever that will support MLMS? Since MLMS, I'm sorry, can everybody please go on mute or is it a question? Okay, so what systems are we going to have maybe from the databases whatsoever? Are all of those systems also authorized? I don't like how they're presenting this information. It seems so packed, hard to read, but um, maybe we are using Cosmos DB. It's also authorized at Fedram High, so that's fine. But what if there is another DB called, I don't know, um, maybe just Azure DB and I cannot see it even here. So maybe it's not authorized as such. We can use it, right? So we have to find an alternative. Going back, now we have our overall system categorization at high. The template is just asking what kind of laws or regulations or documentations did you use? Obviously we use three types of documents because they are the ones that guide us. One, it's 199 document supply. Definitely this is part of it. Also the one that provides the information type applies. You make reference to it, which is this. Uh, 800 60 and volume two, and also 800 60 volume one. You put them in here. The reference ID, maybe also NIST 800 60, right? Uh, volume two. What is the title of the document? Let's see. Uh, this is the volume one, uh, volume two, appendices, blah, blah, blah. Me be lazy, I'm gonna copy and paste. You do that. Uh, you put it, what is the date on the documentation? August 2018, cool, so ancient. Oh. And uh, is there any reference link to that document that we are using? Give me a second, uh, what am I doing? Uh, Where's our document? Oh. Okay, um, the reference link, if there's any, no, we can put it here, I guess. Oh, and then put the fifth one ninety nine or at least same document volume one on whatsoever. Save it. Do we have any attachment to this? Not yet. We don't. But as we start going forward, like the SSP, this is one of the document that you then put as like as an attachment to the document. Actually, we could even say we have yes another one. Maybe uh, what's that document? Maybe it's the planning document, right? That I created. We can attach it here. Put the name of the uh, file. God, I hate this. Okay, MLMS, one document attached to this. Is there a file extension? It was, I presented it in a PPT or is it PDF? I mean, these differ across, right? Who will approve it? The system owner. I am the system owner as Waziri SO, and who is the ISSO? Waziri the ISSO. Finish, and guess what happens? We are done with step one of the RMF, right? We are done with this part, the categorization part. 